This is uh, Robert uh, Stark. I am uh, here with uh, Francis Nally. We're going to be discussing uh, his latest uh, book, Queer Culture, A Transgressive Tradition, An Introduction for the Normie and the Misguided Artist. Francis, great talking to you. It's nice talking to you, Robert, and it's nice talking to you, Matt. Yeah, great to be here. Great talking to you as well, Francis. These are themes you've been writing about, including uh, some essay essays you've written about includes your lexicon and uh, also some pieces, any pieces from previous novels or most of it is original material? It's all original material uh, starting from 2018 and through the last pretty much uh, 10, 12 months of my own activity, what I saw and observed on the internet and as well as the current uh, internet fringe scene and um just like the previous book, um, A Manifesto About Stalking Patrick Highlands, that was written during a, a tire 2017, this book was more uh, not just an essay collection, but as well as the creation of a giant argument, and this time the first, you could say, one big uh, 22 or 30,000 uh, word essay based upon a peculiar topic of queer culture and why it's uh, very popular in the internet sphere. So, uh, first of all, to define uh, queer, a queer originally meant just strange or different, and then later on it meant uh, homosexual. So by queer, you don't necessarily mean homosexual, but there's some significant degree of overlap. Yeah, I mean, when I had some critics, when I was showing the draft to some friends, they said, why not call it uh, weird or eccentric or strange? Well, there's a line of books called Weird Pennsylvania and Weird New Jersey, but the word queer has the classic origin of being the social outsider. And yes, it does mean homosexuality today because the gay community have op, you know, have used it to refer to that, you know, homosexual people make the most interesting art. But always to mind to my mind when I think of queer, it's an eccentric person like John Waters or Richard Simmer, Simmons or, or Paul Lynn. It's, it's a very strange individual. And I think it's time that uh, people need to go back and understand what it means to be queer. And again, the, the act of having homosex, you know, gay sex or something like that doesn't immediately make you a queer. You could be asexual and still be considered queer. And so there's a lot to consider what is queer and what's not queer. There's this uh, concept of being just kind of a non-conformist uh, just for the sake of being different or, or sake of being uh, weird just for the sake of being weird. And uh, I mean, sure, there's a lot of people like this, but uh, this has to kind of go beyond that. I mean, that's almost basically a, a pretty much of a cliche. Well, it's cliche that people are different. And that today we live in a society which is very extremely different. But there is this conformity now that people need to be queer in order to make uh, a movement or something unique or original now in the art world. And uh, that's something called a queer resume, where um, it's about if you are maybe a black girl with blue hair and you draw uh, violence. What was that uh, in your book, like you were giving examples of a, of a queer resume and you listed two different people and you gave the hypotheticals of like where they were from, their background, and like they had this happen to them? Well, the point is that someone who is white, cis, and normative is not going to be uh, worshipped as an artist. And maybe a black girl with blue hair and from a country that's outside the United States of America is going to be worshipped as this fine artist that will be elected as the next um, MFA professor, right? And so today we have a very extremely anti-normative society, which is good and bad, but it mainly is an understanding that we have to understand what's really going behind, uh, what's really happening. And some scenes on the internet, like the alt-right, have been having a huge, you know, they've been infighting is because they don't understand that they're all queers and even participating in clandestine or fringe movements on the internet makes you a queer. And so instead of understanding the world as left-wing versus right-wing, anti-white versus pro-white, 
it really boils down to who's queer and who isn't queer or a normie. And so the white guy is going to be a normie compared to the black girl who's queer. I guess the one thing to kind of clarify is uh, when talking about the, the queer uh, culture, you use the concept to refer to both the people within the liberal elite and people who are outs- outsiders. So your point is that that might be a little bit confusing to some, but your point is that it can apply to both groups. Well, queer ultimately means you're a, a, a social outcast, a loser, but you're also different because you're an intellectual artist or the normative society has not influenced you. You're an individual looking for other individuals and queers to relate to you. That's why, you know, the transgressive liberal elite is obsessed with egalitarianism or this ideal of uh, political equality because it's not equality for normative people. It's only equality for other like-minded queers and interesting people. And it's a way to convert or proselytize the normie to tolerate, tolerate queer behavior and hopefully kill off and destroy normative values like football, uh, physically <laughs> and verbally, verbally abusive dads, and Republicans. And uh, that's exactly what America is heading towards. It isn't so much a pro versus anti-white paradigm. The paradigm is a social condition of the artist against the normative per- the Philistine who isn't an artist. But is it does it really break down along those lines uh, so so evenly? Because when I read uh, your writing on queer culture, uh, I was constantly reminded of the concept we've talked about in this show of um, neurotribalism, uh, just kind of people with different. Uh, often, you know, more introverted people with very niche interests kind of coming together around that. But are you arguing that people with all those different kind of obsessive queer interests, um, do they as a collected whole form a group? Or is it more of the war of like many different types of queers in your mind? It's more of the latter where there's a war. There's been attempts at trying to make a queer collective. And you might see that with LGBTQ or even this higher academia, right? But ultimately that becomes a new normative value. And this cultural queerness doesn't make you queer any longer. It makes you like a preening consumer. And so the real queers have always been against people who are um, pseudo-queers or posers. Um, These are people especially like, say, you're part of the Gay Straight Alliance, right? And this is just a, gener- a normative club of tolerating, you know, different sexuality, of homosexuality, right? But the queers, they think that the GSA, their Gay Straight Alliance, doesn't cater to queer culture and very eccentric differences. So they develop this anarcho kind of we're queer, we're here, radical activism, and they need to destroy all normies in this nihilistic kind of extreme Bolshevism or something like that. But I think it's more uh, queers are always fighting against one another. And as much as there is this loving community that they make, especially in liberalism and the Democratic Party, um, it's just not happening because, once again, there always will be a new issue on some tabloid magazine that some cis and normative guy is culturally appropriating some queer culture because there is this eternal hatred against normative and cis values. And there's this uh, idea of the queer artistic elite, and it's very similar to the whole concept of aristocratic uh, radicalism. Yeah, and queer culture to some extent is what Western society has gone to. Or, In other words, uh, I think... Um, there's been this huge YouTube paradigm of anti-SJW videos, of this whole anti-liberalism from Sargon of Akkad to, I don't know, Paul Joseph Watson, and they just want a normative, rational society of not being this um, agitating, blue-haired SJW. But the irony is that the new, quote-unquote, SJW is a right-wing SJW, or some type of, uh, you are anti-SJW, but you act like a Midwesterner uh, consuming in video games and on Discord and want your safe space. So it's not just that once upon a time there were SJWs. This is a, a byproduct of the millennial generation, and I don't know about Zoomers, possibly Zoomers, but... This is ultimately something that's happening under capitalism, 
And you can't have any radical movement unless you criticize or replace the system of capitalism that is making all this cultural stuff happen. And you could also say that queer culture is a result of the materialistic and consuming or merchant exploitive nature of capitalism. But I think capitalism is just currently the, the current trending vehicle to get queer culture out there. But uh, right now, I think queers are starting to understand that capitalism what it does is exploits one another and you just have to play the game and so this is why queers want socialism is because it's for a queer homo nationalist or socialist uh, elite so where... the need the need for uh socialist is so they're more uh, socialist policies are so the queer queers are more become more uh economically uh, independent yeah with a universal basic income where you could focus on the arts then work at a mundane, mundane job at Home Depot or flip burgers at McDonald's. You don't have to do that. You don't have to contribute to society. You, know, you contribute to your own queer society and not, you know, you let normative people get the STEM degrees and be construction workers. The queer should become the artists, the teachers and whatnot. And it's turning out that society is now like that. And, um, but I see ultimately whether queer or normie, both classes suffer under capitalism because everyone is being exploited by someone else. And because of capitalist normative values of trying to make money, you basically have distorted and perverted lens of working together and creating art and the ideal of having a target audience and that you won't be written history unless you have a target audience or someone to exploit off of someone and so this is the reason why there's so much petty internet drama and why the alt-right and richard spencer's career has tanked so much and it's just happening because the movement that was once uh, radical it by the end by the early teens is now it is is dying and this might be something of the teens decade but uh it shows you that i think for the first time people will learn from this giant in fighting that really what has survived for the past decade is the fascination of queer culture and the eccentric individual. What do you think about the narrative that hard work pays off that you often get from a PragerU and a Jordan Peterson? Well, that's just a currently a myth used to tell people that if they work hard enough, they will get what they deserve and then kind of... Um, you know, get the house or their career or their occupation, you know, as a famous musician or something. But the problem with that is that not every um, black person can be a basketball player or famous hip hop star. Uh, that's only like literally one of a hundredth. But everybody is being told they can be that if they practice the arts. And you cannot be an artist under capitalism unless you have an exploited group of consumers. And um, so Prager U says that, and Jordan B. Peterson as well, that you know if somehow if you work at Home Depot and keep clocking in the hours, you'll build a good character and you'll realize that's the way of the world. But that's only this kind of soft defeatism of just accepting this exploitive reality. It's like putting a smiley face on as Rome is burning. And uh, what it is really, it distorts and it's propaganda to create normative people. It's really anti-queer propaganda, and this is why queers and eccentrics uh, hate PragerU and Republicans is because they are creating the normative institution. Now, the irony is that queers do like Jordan B. Peterson and PragerU on the fact that it's anti-liberal or transgressive, and anything that is transgressive or contradicts queer culture, queers actually like it. It's kind of like deconstruction where you deconstruct itself, and so it does have that opposite effect, but realize that... Queers would only advocate PragerU to the extent that it gets their queer kick of transgressive arts off, but when it starts propagating cis and quote-unquote fascistic values, then they stop. Uh, you talk about the concept of the merchant exploiters, and this is similar to the economic uh, concept. Uh, the blogger line of the blogosphere calls it value transfers. Uh, basically, you have the artist, and uh, these are people... The people who uh, profit off of the artist, uh, it's an economic concept, but uh, what context were you referring to? I'm, I'm referring to just, like, basic cultural capitalism, or that this ideal of that you must be 
in order to be free in America, you must run a business or you must be a merchant selling someone stuff. And you have to sell some skill or some cultist religion, you know, and say <clears throat> you're fighting for the revolution or something. But in, in reality, it's just a nice capitalist living. And there's a lot of problems with that. And so what I'm saying is that um, under, the reason why queer culture is so hard to understand is that it's it's also something that's directly happening under capitalism and say if you're um, uh, a pro-capitalist or you're some kind of person who lives in furry fandom or some or a video gamer and you're not thinking about these things well you're going to escape into your own reality you mm. don't care about these things right you only care about say uh, game design or science fiction literature and as you'll probably die in the next 60 to 70 years um these things like we're all influenced under capitalism and it's this inedible kind of force that's influencing all cultural norms and that's why you're having people who are anti-SJW but then ironically act like an SJW because they are okay by consenting to be consumers. As far as being uh, transgressive, what do you think about uh, people who are transgressive just for the sake of being transgressive? And this could apply to leftists who try to shock conservatives, but also elements of our right-wing uh, troll culture. Well, a lot of Zoomers today are transgressive because they think it's funny. They think it's funny to deny the Holocaust or to say racist jokes on the Internet. They can't get caught. But at the same time, they want this cultural norm of saying, hey, it's just a joke, right? And the older generations, they don't, they don't understand. They take this stuff sincerely. And so what the millennial and even the Zoomer, they don't understand is that they are a byproduct of this queer culture around them. Our culture praises the unique, eccentric individual known as the queer and in the art world, uh, it's not being like Leonardo da Vinci or Thomas Kincaid where you are painting a beautiful cottage out on a beach and everything is perfected and you're loved by the masters. Instead, it's just creating piss Christ or some Rothko color blocks and implying this kind of Peter Haley French philosophy about things. And then the artist you know, is creating aesthetics or some kind of james terrell color zones you know and that's what's loved in the art world right but it's taken to an extent where the normative robert smith can't make art anymore because he's cis and normative but the black girl who's into japanese culture can because her condition is very queer and so today especially the zoomers they don't understand that they're brought up into this strange eccentric nature and that they think this whole, like, just by consuming all this cultural queerness going around, what's being elevated among the millennials is who's the biggest queer, right? But you won't really have a say if you're just Robert S Smith with cis values from Ohio anymore. And that's all part of being transgressive. It's transgressive because it's inseparable from queer culture. Queerness is transgressive. It's being a social outsider. It's a natural thing. You can't separate it from being queer. So same with uh, being a nonconformist just for the sake of it. It has to come uh, naturally because basically if, you, if you're transgressive just for the sake of it, I guess an example of that would be, as you pointed out, like the piss Christ and being a nonconformist just for the sake of that, then you end up becoming part of the, I guess what you would call cultural capitalism. Yeah, I mean, there's been this issue where I had a discussion with a friend is who are the normies and who are the queers and what do you make of when normies try to act like queers? But the thing is, and there's we're not, seeing this today. there's a, obviously there's like a gradation scale, like there's not, like they're queer versus a normie, they're kind of guidelines, but it's not like there's a yeah. queer dividing line. Yeah, well, I'm talking about, you know, for instance, it's queer Stacy's, right? I strongly believe women are biologically dependent, and because of this, their nature makes them more dependent on what society surrounds them with. So if they have a boyfriend who is very exploitive or into punk rock music, right, she's going to be in punk rock music herself and think she, her, that's her culture. If she has a jock, chad, cis, normative boyfriend, she's going to be a, a big tit Stacy Tinder chick, right? And so... 
um, you know, under society, right, queerness is how non-cis and normative you are, and that's outside of who you are as a person. So what's normative? Being like a, a Christian, white, straight male can't be that under queer society. And so you might have this group of people like, say, in the alt-right, Richard Spencer, who believes he's a part of this unique new queer culture. And for some extent, yeah, Richard Spencer is a queer. Uh, the issue, however, becomes that doing the right thing and advocating Christian morality doesn't make you queer because it's doing the right thing. Like Antifa, for example, believes they're doing the right thing by getting rid of uh, quote-unquote fascism. But Antifa, what they really want is regional identity, hardcore punk venues everywhere, and unique queerness. What Antifa understands over the alt-right is Antifa is fighting for queerness. And the alt-right only thinks it's queer on the fact that they're hated by society ironically says burn degenerates um, I would classify the alt-right as a self-hating queer party hmm. because they are queers but they don't want to come to their terms to their queerness of reading Julius Evola you simply can't be a Chad nationalist while reading Julius Evola or Savitri Devi or being a quote-unquote culture thug what happens is you're kind of this, um, there's this term online, um, wignat, wigger nationalist. <laughs> you're just this kind of, you're a wignat, and you're trying to be normative, but impossible. So the wignat is itself queer. And so if only the alt-right could understand this nature of queerness and the transgressive tradition, and this fascination with normative behaviors, right? Queers ultimately hate normies. They're not compatible. So once you join the alt-right, you are queer and you hate normies. There is no possible society. You can't, you know, you can't advocate a society which is normative because you want everyone to be twisted like you into worship of black sons and weird, eclectic, racist jokes and things like that. And so, yeah, I find that completely the issue. It's just that normies are just byproducts of it. They're just under cultural queerness by thinking having blue hair and reading up on quote-unquote feminist theory mm -hmm. that somehow makes them queer, but in return they're just pawns for a bigger queer aristocracy that's trying to make the normie cater to their own interest. Uh, yeah, well, you, uh, you call it the avant-garde uh, hate and how basically the far right it lost its uh, cultural vanguard. And you explain why because uh, basically of uh, the whole rejecting queer culture like or being self-hating queers you say that's the problem was it different you're saying there was this period where the far right was a genuine cultural vanguard or that was an issue from the beginning well it was once i would say it was a genuine cultural vanguard probably around 2010 to 2015 that first five years but before and after and present time it's back into queer culture it was queer in the 90s and 2000s, and now it's queer again. And the cultural vanguard was this kind of anti-liberal movement where it was this unique queerness where you could be accepted as this progressive queer, but today it's now the self-destructive avant-garde hate type of queer. And when I refer to avant-garde hate, I'm referring to people like uh, Jim Goad, Anal Cunt, the Mentors, Gigi Allen, these are punk rocker types who want to make the audience feel hate. So you're By talking doing... more about, the, as a cultural vanguard, you're referring more to the apocalypse culture that existed before the alt-right? Yeah, apocalypse culture, that scene, they were invested in avant-garde hate, feeling hate and shocking and being transgressive. But the part of it is, it's in the punk rock tradition, right? A part of punk rock is self is hating yourself and feeling verbal abuse and maybe physical abuse because you can't be a nice Christian and be into hardcore. You have to be, you have to feel pain. You have to have been raped or, or something like that, and that gives the person who has been hated su superiority. But this relatively avant-garde hate is kind of this really this liberal thing. It's ironic because it's very liberal because, in a way, it's like being Asian and saying, I dated black men. How progressive is that? Right? Yeah, and I'm sure yeah. when Answer Me back in the 90s, I'm sure a lot of the people who read it back then, obviously it's a lot different now, but back then a lot of the people who read it, I'm sure were very, very liberal. 
Uh, don't get me wrong. Jim Goat is a liberal. Um, he's mired by Chuck Palahniuk and Margaret Cho. If he had his little group <laughs> hug podcast and said, how dare Pill Eater make a religion based upon fetishizing Asian women? In a way, Goad's acting like a, a liberal saying that I am treating Asian women as sexual objects. That sounds like someone on a progressive would say, right? But that's what avant-garde hate does. It tries to... You know, it tries to tell someone is a, a, a all their weakest values who they are and embrace that hate and make you feel it. But really, Goad, this is why Jim Goad's loved by liberals so much, is because he's saying the liberal voice in an avant-garde hate way by constantly being skeptical about hierarchies and institutions, right? It's like being, it's like kind of being Hunter S. Thompson in a way. And, um... See, this is the liberalism. Well, what Jim Goat says about himself, which I, which I respect in him, is that um, you know his whole throughout his life, his uh, modus operandi has been to kind of take the supposedly sacred stories put in front of him and deconstruct them. So I don't know if he's a liberal or not, but definitely there is that he, he's a died in the wall anti-establishmentarian, um, and this white advocacy he's doing lately. Um, is just a, a chapter in a, in a long life of that, um, starting with rejecting uh, nuns in Catholic school, is how I understand the story. Yeah, I, I mean, the point is it comes from punk hardcore culture, which Jim had a huge investment in. And being yeah, and which, white... is always, which has always been a part of, of liberal uh, you know, counterculture. So there well, is that interesting connection. Well, Matt, do you see any parallels between uh, people who joined uh, left-wing countercultures uh, in the past, and even some people who ended up in the establishment, and uh, people who are joining uh, right-wing countercultures uh, today? Certainly. I mean, I haven't, you know, been to a lot of the uh, like alt-right uh, events and stuff like that. But I, I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely, definitely attracts a similar personality. Um, and you know, if you look at the, the Proud Boys, which isn't necessarily an alt right group, but uh, it's it's kind of in line with that uh, punk rock culture. So there's absolutely similarities because that is like rejecting the normie. Uh, that theme exists both in the original uh, left wing countercultures of the '60s, but you also see that within uh, aspects of online. Uh, you see that strain, that mentality more with like 4chan culture. Certainly, yeah, and it's a product of a strange cultural moment, I think, where. Uh, the, the left, for lack of a better term, I don't like to pay with too out of a brush, but liberals, you know, won the culture war, so now they are in positions of power. Even queer, the very queer outsider liberals are still treated with a degree of sympathy by, by the media and those, uh, you know, the liberal elite. Um, so the new, the new people who are truly rebelling against the order are pretty much all uh, some degree of, of, of right wing. Can you explain what you mean by a cultural uh, fascism, and also the example of Harlem Venison's uh, book book review over a countercurrence and by Omera, and how that wasn't well recepted overall by the far right because it didn't fit into their narrative, and how that relates to cultural fascism? Well, cultural fascism, uh, as I previously stated, is um, basically normative values, which you know, or the um, you know, far right values in um well for Harlan Venison's book review on countercurrents, that was some years back when he had Death to the World. And James J. O'Mara, who I will consider a queer, did a review of the book. You know, Harlan Venison advocates an acid right or some type of alt left. Again, all the books that James J. O'Mara advocates really goes under the radar. And um most people on countercurrents, their their age range is usually 30s to 40s. I mean, and this is because they're all Greg Johnson's friends, and everybody else <laughs> who's reading countercurrents are are pretty much just interesting, esoteric, cultural fascist punk kids or um, just some internet uh, scholars, right? And um, it really is just a, a knack for that kind of far right stuff. But the problem is that. I, and I said this in my own uh, said this in my book as well is that countercurrents wants to wave its flag as the North American New Right when it's really just Greg Johnson's outlet 
to make his his publishing company to make a couple of more bucks from his book sales and to would give money to John Morgan and everyone who has you know set up his meetings. It's yes, you could get the quote unquote ball moving by advocating this. Well, this, that, uh, yeah, that's true. But do you think making a living basically? Uh, I don't see how that does that inherently uh, corrupt something because look, we all have to make a living and either. You talk about socialism and how ideally there would be some kind of a basic income and all that, but basically the alternative is you, you find a niche and you find a way to make a living off of your art or, or political views, or you uh, basically uh, try to make it in the capitalist economy. So yeah, everyone has to find a way to make a living, so I don't see how that's inherently uh, bad or, or uh, maybe it is a product it's- of cultural capitalism, but still... Well, that's actually the thesis of the book, and Robert, I, I have to rebuke you there, is that because it, the thesis of the entire book is that cap, the, the ideal, you just said, a, a natural truth. And so Greg Johnson is exploiting everyone who's a consumer throwing money at him. There is no movement. There can't be a movement of white survival if capitalism still survives. And this is, this is something how academics talk about. And whether they fantasize about socialism or some type of, uh, I like to say post-capitalism, where we could see a capitalist society that is not ruled by globalism, but fake fictional currency of Bitcoin and something and family communal living, right? The problem with capitalism is that it's eating all these resources, and it's just not it's not truthful it's not authentic how can you make a white nationalist revolution through meta politics if it requires people giving you money under a system which suppresses you to have it the the only form of authenticity is capitalism and so truth doesn't come to power if you are exploiting ter- creating an audience of consumers who will become normies and they hate queers or they're right wing sjw's buying into these products, being told Rapture Day is coming, but it never does come. They just live and die. And this is why there's so much infighting in the far right, is because everybody's in it playing a capitalist game. Uh, Everyone has an agenda and a motive, and you as an individual do not have a place in the far right unless you exploit other stupid people by saying truthful things like, um, yeah, the Jews are bad. And then all of a sudden you're getting 10,000 subscribers because you're a seven-year-old girl saying this and inciting Heidegger or something ridiculous, right? And so that's not truthful. That's something of the capitalist nature of the merchant exploiting people. And um, what counter the problem with right now with countercurrents is that it's not really a part of the white. If, if that's the strong, the biggest stronghold of the dissident right right now. At least at this point, art is far more powerful than politics. Absolutely. As I stated that before, we have to really question whether metapolitics is important, right? And if metapolitics is important, then why isn't some ideals about white nationalism surviving in the battlefield with Antifa or the people in positions of power, mainly capitalists, who advocate everyone to, uh, you know, start your queer interests, become a queer, exploit off of other normies, and continue like that life. To me, that is the closest to the truth. And the truth of whites versus anti-whites, that's just a little social construction made up by the white nationalists or some Heideggerian human biodiversity racial war, right? The real war is something happening in Western society where there's this new individual called the queer and the normative people under those queers. And anti-whiteness is happening because the queer wants only queers and wants a good life of living the queer life. And one now thing, one, th- one system that I proposed to go against this queer and normie fight is to convert to anime futurism or Asian Aryanism is because that is the only normative and cisgendered way of living without being a direct result under uh, queer culture. Yet, you can be a queer Asian Aryan if possible, 
But um, again, it seems to me that uh, this this through this decelerationism, what's going to happen is if the queer had his own way, he would want transhumanism, and the queer will you know will be a brain inside a robot so, or virtual reality where anything impossibly can happen, and this is basically where society is heading towards and the white nationalists or the uh, are not talking about this which is so odd yeah one thing on this topic that really resonated with me from your book is this idea that new political movements are forming based on artistic and aesthetic impulses um you write that in your section where you say or declare that art uh, is more important than politics it kind of got me thinking. I'm not sure if art has always been more important than politics. I think the relationship between politics and aesthetics and art and beauty has always been been very close. Um, but I do think there's a, a something unique to the to the modern era with the internet and such and atomization, where um, it's these initial. And this can I can definitely say this in my own case. The the initial sparks that get you interested in, in a new political movement or a new way of thinking about politics are first and foremost uh, aesthetic. Mm. Yeah, I mean, today you can't even, you can't even be, so there's so much queer culture that is censoring other queer thought that you can't even be an interesting individual, right? It's very popular today to be, say, I'm going to do, I'm going to be an anti-liberal, I'm an anti-SJW, I'm going to go against the queer establishment that boomers have created, and because I'm saying this normative stuff that Jordan B. Peterson advocates, that makes me a queer, right? Well, again, that's the nature of being transgressive, and it turns out that eventually those uh, people who are extremely transgressive are going to have to make sense that they are queers creating this uh, transgressive art, and um, and so again, this is why I said Antifa is kind of knowledgeable. Or they know more than the far right because they think the far right is suppressing and censoring uh, new ways, realities, and ecstasies of thinking about people. And so uh, Antifa's pro queer culture, while the far right is just suppressing their nature of being queer because. Again, the, the far right are made up of self-hating queers. Ironically, they're kind of the opposite because the far right or the alt-right are people who think they're defending the normative, but they're the actual queers. And with the Antifa, they think they're the queers, but they're defending the establishment. Well, they're defending the queer establishment. They're, so they're, the Antifa they, they... are defending the queer establishment, and the alt-right... Mm-hmm are queers, but they think they're defending what is what they view as traditional normative values. But those traditional normative values are anti-queer, thus destroying even the purpose of reading Savitri Devi and uh, Julius Evola. Well, ironically, is that the, the alt-light is much more uh, advocate of a kind of a normie values as like what you would describe as Americanism. Well, with the alt-right, that's true to some degree, but there's more of an element of queer culture because they're further removed from the mainstream with the uh, alt-light types, they're more uh, they're more in favor of defending what people would define as mainstream American values. Well, the alt-right has all these uh, subsets with these uh, fringe uh, esoteric interest. Yeah, I mean, um, like the thing is, I just wanted to add on to the aesthetics part, is that... The artist does, you know, the artist has importance over politics because the artist creates metapolitics. But at the same time, I've been very, I've been doubting metapolitics as even a thing. I think the only thing that happens is art. And people are motivated at our artist. And it's not just metapolitics, quote unquote. I think the people desire to become things they see in their mind and act upon it. And then there are people who get jealous and angry over this uh, this reality of the artist trying to be too sincere because we are living in a society which is ironic. And they believe that sincerity is something that is bad because, you know, queers, queers are sincere what they do. Like Review Bra, Wesley Willis, Christian Wilson Chandler, these are sincere people. Who would you say are the most important uh, literary and artistic figures towards uh, queer culture, including starting with the Beatniks and some more recent uh, writers and artists? 
I mean, for example, you could just say Allen Ginsberg or um, William S. Burroughs, you know, all the beatniks like that, and as well as more obscure figures like uh, Quentin Crisp or um, um, Yukio Mishima. I mean, the, the list can go on because, I mean, I mean John Waters, right? The, it, there's a whole canon now for the past 70 years of eccentric individuals that has created and are now loved by our society and they are worshipped right and this is in all the establishment and so i i can't you know the queerness is it's it's kind of this whole it's always being progressed to this new culture that has been happening in the arts in western the western arts and history and it's something that should be learned in order to understand what's really going on in the arts and i find that you know flirting with any fringe politics is actually a form of cultural anthropology and to understand where when people don't understand your art they don't understand that you're a sincere queer right there are people like mr metacore whose whole entire career is about ridiculing queers about ridiculing people who are sincere and i can't believe this guy is making uh, hamsters underwater and has a uh, a Patreon paying five hundred dollars for it, right? I can't believe this is a Pakistani Canadian who has left uh, Canada to talk to birds. Like these are sincere, interesting people, and yet normies and sheep they laugh at these people. It's about the the kind of the canon of um, of queer artists. Uh, correct me if this isn't your thesis, but uh, one thing that strikes me is. With all of these people that we listed, starting with the Beat Generation, of course you could go back further and point to their influences, the modernists, and before that, um, figures like De Saad, um and Nietzsche, uh, and, and, and up through uh, to more uh, modern art. What I would argue is that there is an extremely, extremely, uh, inherently uh, elitist element to what we might call the, the queer arts or the transgressive arts. And these are made by basically people who would fit into the kind of aristocratic radical model. They're generally highly intelligent and also just sexually uh, experimental uh, individuals. And, and I, what I think is, is interesting when you talk about capitalism and cultural capitalism is that we live in this era where uh, you know liberalism has won the uh, culture war uh, uh, gone up right alongside uh, Capitalism and what you get is a kind of marketing and, and uh, dumbing down a prepackaged notion of queerness that enables people, uh, you know, Chad's and Stacey's, as you might refer to them, as um, it enables them to be posers uh, by kind of investing in this prepackaged, in various prepackaged queer identity. But I think that there's, and there is something to me that's really uh, disgusting about that, but, I, but I've always thought um, there's something very redemptive about the queer arts in and of themselves, um, and, and something about them which is is not egalitarian, um, but in fact very elitist. So I don't know if that quite fits in with what you're saying, but yeah. I, I just saw a, a meme or a joke where it said, I remember punk rock where I used to have been called hate. You know, we're talking about 1970s or 80s punk rock, but today, Punk rock is what makes you friends. It what makes you get to higher positions of power. It's how you become an artist. Punk rock is the equivalent of church music today. And it's for this kind of queer Stacy, so supposedly poser Chad, and the real queers who are introverted. The other thing I was going to say earlier, if you don't mind me butting in here, is that we're talking about Antifa versus uh, the alt-right. And I don't think there's ever going to be any unity between these two groups. I don't necessarily think there should be. But I think it's interesting to note that you have um, Antifa, who, who, who supposes that uh, you know uh, these quote-unquote fascists are oppressing them. Um, and when in reality, uh, if they really kind of practice what they preach, they'd be focusing, and they do, some of them, focus much more on, on capitalism. The only point I was trying to make is that I think there's an irony where, in theory, both uh, the alt right and Antifa c could unite against uh, what, you know the real establishment because both groups are anti-establishment. Antifa becomes puppet puppets to the establishment. Um, the alt right tries to create a new establishment, but both are deeply opposed to the establishment as it exists. Well, I think um, 
Antifa, they're they're dumb and normative and <clears throat> stupid is because they're so caught up in they're unaware about being queer, right? It's healthy in the nature that they are queers, all of Antifa. To be a member of Antifa, you have to be queer. Um, some of them are just, you know, normatives, normie people who don't like mean things, and those are normative values. But the true Antifa leaders are queer, and they understand this. And they are part of something called the cult of the extroverts, where they think that being extroverted somehow will write history, that by not creating art and by going out and being a political demagogue, you can somehow rally up the masses and create a political revolution. The same cult of the extroverts exists within the boomer generation that if you stay in your parents' basement and you're on the computer, you won't amount to anything to life. Yet the irony is people are getting famous is because they make a YouTube video and now there are record labels and movie companies knocking on their door because they expose themselves to the world by just staying at home. And so there is this shame against the introverted person, yet today anyone who is extroverted is normative and stupid um, because extroverted people are not creating society. The artist creates people, creates bigger movements by having interaction with a few people, not by going out to the bar or going out in public and trying to preen of something and so uh, I, the thing is which is really interesting is that there is this divide between Antifa and the alt-right is because Antifa again they don't know they don't there's no Antifa YouTube or blogs they're, they're just discovering this and they realize that they think it's all about regional identity and the community but regional identity is just something that capitalism does to keep you sedated so you won't have any sense of nationality or national identity right you know meanwhile people in the alt-right they're from the midwest or some isolated area they're they're behind a computer because they work at they hate their jobs and they hate their life and so they're the ones struggling and creating art that's influencing people while the the the, the antifa and the cult of the extroverts they think by going out to the bar every other friday is somehow going to be a part of the revolution when it's just they're consuming doom what is the role of uh, sexual uh, outsiders? I mean, this is traditionally uh, meant homosexuals, but today this could basically be anyone who's basically outside of what is considered uh, acceptable sexual behavior. Well, if I mean, if you want to say acceptable sexual behavior, that's male and female, right? Um, I mean, anything outside that, you get it's easy to be called a queer. You could be a weatherman and say, I'm gay. Yet there's no evidence you ever committed sod sodomy. There's no film, gay porno video of you taking it up the butt or you putting <laughs> it up the butt, right? You can't do that. And so it's easy today to say, I'm gay, right? This is a phase I went through four or five years ago when I thought, oh, I'll just say I'm gay because, well, that makes me special and makes me interesting. But did it mean I had gay sex? And the answer is no. And so today, especially with Zoomers, you can basically say you're gay but have no evidence of being gay, and that automatically makes you queer. It's it's like saying you're one half quarter black or, or something, and therefore you're not white and cis. Or, and, or one yeah. one thousand whatever if uh, Native American like Elizabeth Warren. I have a couple more questions like on on the book, um, or at least let me see yeah here. yeah he's just yeah go ahead. Oh, so I'm interested in the lexicon. Um, the the book, your book, uh, ends with a very extensive and eclectic lexicon of different terms that you associate with uh, what you call post neo folk or, or otherwise known as the alt left. Um, I guess two part question. Uh, one is how would you define post neo folk, or in other words, what is this lexicon aiming towards? And then the other thing is it, you also write something interesting about how these terms in this lexicon you've created. Um, should be juxtaposed so as to create art. And this is something you've done on your Instagram, for example, putting a picture of whatever that dog, Huckleberry Hound or whatever, with like... Vishnu. Uh, with Vishnu and, and things like that. Um, I guess, what were you what were you going for with that? I kind of read it as a form of collage art, but what would be the ideological like underpinning? Well, I, I start to understand that a lot of people get into the far right because they found music uh, in industrial rock or neo-folk like Dead Can Dance or Leibach or KMFDM or, or something like that. And 
that remains a huge part in the early development of the far right of again reading the lightning in the sun and then finding going down the wormhole and then discovering voice of reason radio network uh, i end with the my the pamphlet book by saying that the way forward and out of this infighting with queers and since the reader now has an understanding that you know it's capitalism and queer culture fighting against one another in order to make the next transgressive art maybe what's considered transgressive is this type of post neo folk and not just traditional neo folk traditional neo folk would rely on the black sun or some cryptic far right you know runes which is now very popular but now Again, that it's um, it was cutting edge in the 80s and 90s, but today it seems to be it's at its cultural fascist end. And what's really transgressive is a post neo folk where you get the eclectic nature of postmodernism, and then you start <clears throat> to imply that the, what's kind of instills totalitarian fear and eccentric taboos into images that you didn't think were otherwise offensive and things like seven up I, I i write an extensive definition in the book but um the lexicon what it does is it gets objects and things together so you can put them together to understand so the lexicon like this, right? is a list of it's a list of uh, people that are mentioned that you've mentioned and various people in our circle have mentioned and also concepts and Yes, in objects and things, right? I mean, for example, the far right once had a meme about, oh, I believe it was like buffalo wings or something. And <laughs> the reason why they would go to these poll parties for buffalo wings because, oh, that's where Nazis meet or something. But then it became a part of this pool party culture, right? The, the far right made up its own esoteric things, which are not related to the far right, and tried to incorporate it. Or it's like the, 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 the better example, like that bobbing head pigeon, right? The pigeon emoji that bobs its head is somehow racist, and now they're ag ag agitating and antagonizing the people who say it's racist, right? And that's, I guess, is something that makes a, pa a part of post-neofolk in that it also offends the far right. That, again, if you're sincere that 7-Up Soda has something to do with Hinduism, you're not only queer, but you're hated by both uh, the far right, far left, and normies who just don't understand you. It's like believing in ancient alien theory, right? And so um, I was particularly influenced by the work of Sean Partridge and, and pop art, where you, 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 know, you are referring to a 1970s or the 1960s, where there was this period of you know, like Brandon Adamson cites about like a last explicit whiteness, but you're also flirting with this white culture, right? I mean, you could say it's like offensive because it's all whites doing these artistic things. It's this kind of acid left thing. But at the same time, uh, I'd like to move forward from that and not just talk about white nationalism. Because you can't just limit yourself the tools what the right gives you because what the right is lacking in is that it thinks podcast names like the gas station is somehow transgressive and original when really it's just the old holocaust jokes right it, it, it doesn't it's not up to date right it's, it's it has to be a lot of other things too and you could also say that Sam Hyde of Million Dollar Extreme has perfected this but again we can't just again be trapped where oh yeah a minute for white survival at all all it matters no it's not only anti-liberal but it's also queer and what what's better is honesty because you know power is truth you know truth to power right and if you were an artist and you were saying that the cbsi is actually a symbol for the illuminati or that there's a a black sun behind the peacock you kind of create this new aesthetic that's wow, I never knew something so mundane like the Golden Arches have something to do with radical jihadism that hates. And so you can make all these eclectic connections together. And this is pretty much the new transgressive queer art. Um, you just have to be sincere about it. All right. Um, so when we were preparing for this show, Francis, you said that you hope this book would be the uh, Marshall Mathers LP of the post-alt-right, which I found amusing on a few levels. But uh, I, I think this concept of the... Uh, the post-alt-right is interesting, um, and it kind of ties into what you were saying a moment ago, because I think we've hit a phase where, um, you know, the, the alt-right kind of 
was what it was. I don't really think it's going anywhere anymore. But I think that we, as consumers or, or people who witnessed it, um, have kind of digested what it had to offer aesthetically and what it represented as tied into a populist force and are, are now kind of moving forward. So I just wanted to say that I think that term that you used of post-alt-right is uh, useful, possibly more useful than alt-left or alt-center or post neo folk, because I think it kind of describes the, the moment that we find ourselves in. And uh, I, I'm working on a sequel to my uh, homo-nationalism article on ultracenter.com um, that will hopefully tie into some of this because I kind of I'm developing a, a theory of, of of where I where I see this going. What I think I, I think what we're trying to define now is what the legacy of um, the alt right will in fact be, and I do think it will be um, an aesthetic legacy. Yeah, I mean the purpose of my book was to actually give a new direction for this quote-unquote post-alt-right, where it's still post-alt-right because there's still old members like Andy Nowicki and Colin Liddell that remember the good old days, but now they got to create a new direction where, well, are you really for anti-liberalism, or are you really for white survival, or is this actually some hidden Freudian homo-nationalism, or some eccentric journalist in Japan, or, or something like that? And that, to me, is more aligned with the truth, right? And I think that if people on the far right understand that they're artists, and I think people like Beardson Beardley understands he's an artist, and he wants to be like Sam Hyde, you know, he is creating something new out of this. And I, I'm just helping create this bridge where this book can be an introduction and a new path for the person who is actually confused about all this infighting going on and what new art form to create while still being transgressive, interesting, and queer, right? It's not a book that's against queers. It's actually celebrating queer culture. It's just that people need to be educated about why are these eccentric YouTube individuals appear up, say one thing about advocating the norm, and then disappear on the scene. It's um, And really, I, I'm trying to basically put everything in this box that in some way or another we're all queers uh, we are at the end of the show I would like to uh, thank uh, Francis Nally for being on uh, check out his book uh, Queer Culture A Transgressive Tradition thank you Robert and also uh, thanks Matthew absolutely it's been great talking to you guys